in Costa Rica. Linda Marshall, those of you who don't know, Juan, I'm going to keep going until you tell me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's I think it's moving now. It's moving now. Linda, we had a lot of people rewatching your uh, phototherapy uh, Monday session. Okay, good. We're we are live on Facebook now. Again, Facebook kind of um, laid out on us, but we are we're live. Okay, Robert has a mask on. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's a still shot, but it's good. And Nathan's here. Alan Ross is here. Uh, Ronnie, just before uh, we get going here, I met Ronnie uh, in. <laughs> I've left it on a workshop where we had the worst food on the planet. But Ronnie is an amazing photographer. Um, great wolf pictures we met at a wolf preserve uh, center here. So anyway, I think we should get going, right, Juan? Yeah, let's with, get going, Rick. We're going to uh, get going. Enough for chit-chat now that we're going. So here we go. So, oh, oh, you know, I'm sharing the screen. I could stop. What are you drinking, Juan? I, I stopped. Oh, I am drinking, again, my pomegranate cosmopolitan recipe. Somewhat, I had uh, at least one person from last week's um, that used the recipe, and they gave me some feedback to say they loved it. So well, it's one cheers. of my favorite new drinks. I'm drinking cheers. My, what are you drinking? I'm drinking my IPA. Lagunitas IPA, yeah. Yeah, nice. Alec is our moderator, so he doesn't drink uh, during these. No, I'm on the Snapple. <laughs> He's on the Snapple. Anyone else want to? Share a drink. Tell us what they're. Uh... Well, this is a serious group here. It's serious group. Maybe moving to Thursdays, people feel like they don't, they can't have a drink on Thursdays. Yeah, Linda. Red oh, Ronnie's got something. Yeah. Hey, by the way, Tom Reese. Uh, Tom Reese was with us in uh, China. He's posting really funny stuff on uh, on the phototherapy page. So thank. Did you get a haircut, Tom? Tom got a haircut. Uh, I haven't gotten one yet. I'm going back to the Woodstock days. But anyway, thank you so much all for joining. And uh, we're going to start now with the uh, with the fun and the uh, educational part of this. So I'm sharing my screen. So here we go. Okay, <clears throat> so this is actually kind of cool. We only started this, uh, I don't know, six weeks ago, we already have uh, 1465 members. So I really want to thank everybody for for sharing all their pictures, all their enthusiasm, uh, all, all their great work. But I also want to thank our moderators that you see over on the right here. Uh, Jim Griggs, as I said, an amazing photographer. Alec Aaron's a great photographer. He's up here shooting birds in my backyard the other day. Uh, Linda Denise Marshall, <laughs> uh, Linda D. Uh, she's she's been on more than a few workshops. Again, she does the motivation, uh, the meditation Monday. And of course, my longtime ten-year friend uh, Juan Pons. So anyway, if you it's look more over than ten the, years, it's more than ten years. Yeah, oh God, we're getting old. We so started the podcast ten years ago, like over ten years ago now. So think about that. So it must be it must be twelve years, right? My gosh. So anyway, uh, you see, over you didn't there, have white hair back then, right? Uh, I maybe <laughs> I did. I didn't have as much. <laughs> I didn't have as much, right? Didn't right. have as much. So anyway, uh, thank you so much for tagging your pictures, putting the topic. This is very important. You see, we have wildlife. We have 111 uh, posts in uh, in the wildlife. Now, Alec and I, Alec gets up uh, as early as I do, around six o'clock in the morning, and we spent from about six o'clock in the morning to about four thirty, and <laughs> in the afternoon, he's laughing. Uh, adding the topics. So please add the topics because if you want people to see your work, this is really important. Add that topic. I don't think you could do it from the iPhone, but you could definitely, or an iPad, but you could, you need to be on your computer. So that's one thing. The other thing is now we're all in one happy hour and photo therapy Tuesday <laughs> has been <laughs> combined into happy hour Thursdays. Uh, Juan's busy. I'm busy. We, every other week, it just got to be too much. So if you want to take a screenshot of this, it's every going to be every Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern until we change it again. <laughs> I, well, I, you, know, you know, the thing is, you know, summer gets a little bit busy for people and people want to go away on Fridays for long weekends and stuff. I mean, I know I do. Yeah, so yeah. Um, moving it to Thursdays allows you hopefully more of you guys to join us. Absolutely. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is uh, this uh, week's theme is... Um, wildlife. So we picked our, Juan and I picked our favorite wildlife pictures, 
And we're going to go through those first. Then I'm going to show some of my favorite wildlife pictures. Then Juan's going to show his. So, well, so sorry. I think you said um, what we did is we picked a number of our favorite wildlife pictures as they were posted on the yeah, photo from the therapy group. Yeah. group. Right. So we're going to basically look at images that you guys posted first, and then we're going to talk about our images. Right. You know, we thought, you know, you guys may be sick of uh, seeing our images. So uh, we wanted to, you know, tell you a little bit about what we think about your images. Absolutely. So I love this picture. Juan's been in the rainforest. I've been in the rainforest. We've been in jungles shooting animals mm -hmm. up in a tree that are backlit <laughs> with the branches all around them, I think is one of the hardest subjects to photograph. So I love this photograph. I love the eyes. I love the catch light in the eyes. I love the gesture. I love the little baby there. I love the composition. A uh, couple of things I might have done, I might have blurred the background so, so we don't see all those circles in the back. And I might have darkened the trees. But knowing how hard it is to uh, photograph an animal in a tree, I think this is an amazing shot. Juan? Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, this is a lemur. I'm, so, I'm assuming from Madagascar, unless it's one of the preserves around the world. It is. They have lemurs. Um, you know, beautiful, beautiful capture. I love the the connection that we're making with the eyes. Um, you know, one of the tricks that I do when I'm photographing wildlife, which is most of the time, and something that I would do here is I would bring a little bit more light onto the eye, especially on the left hand eye, um, because it's kind of in the, in, the in the shadow of the animal. So I would first bring in a little bit more um uh, light into the shadows by moving that shadow slider a little bit and maybe toning down the highlights. For example, on the left hand side, that big bright part of that trunk is a little bit, um, a little bit hot and a little bit uh, uh, too bright, which is distracting me. And then I would bring in a little bit more light into those eyes. Um, but I love the expression and and you know got very lucky that um, you got this lemur kind of out in the open while it was still in the trees. Like you said, it's hard. It's to really hard. These guys, yeah. How about blurring the background? Yeah, I mean, it is what it is. I would, you know, ideally would want to blur the background. You know, maybe, I don't know what the settings were in this camera. Maybe having shot this at a, um, you know, uh, wider aperture would have been better. Would, you may have been able to get a little bit more out of focus in the background. But you can certainly do that in post as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so I mean, I, I think that blurring out a little bit may remove... Um, some of the distractions of the the of the sky poking in through the through the leaves. Yeah, because I want it to look like it looks to my eyes, and we don't see those we don't see those uh, circles. But again, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'd be thrilled to get a shot like that. Okay, Stephen yes. shot. I mean, talk about you were just talking about connection, <laughs> uh, Stephen. You should send this to Hallmark or make your own. Make this like a Father's <laughs> Day card, right? I mean. Talk about the connection, the gesture, uh, the the uh, our human feelings that we project onto animals. I, I think this is just one of the uh, one, and and it's actually framed for cover of a magazine too, right? We, which is actually another good tip. You know, shoot tight, but I always shoot a little wide just in case I could get the uh, uh, get a cover. The only thing I might do. And again, all this is subjective, all art is subjective, is I might boost the contrast a little. Because obviously it's taken an overcast day, which is easy to shoot, shoot on. But uh, I just, you know, it's, I, if I had to describe this one word, it'd be precious. I, I agree. I think, you know, I love those images where there's connection, both with the viewer, but even more so between, you know, on a mother and its offspring. Mm -hmm. Um, and like you said, it's a, it is a tight shot. I think it may have liked it a little bit more open, being able to see, you know, a little bit on the right hand side, you see how on that right hand side, we have the uh, rear end of that, um, uh, of that sow kind of really mm -hmm. close to the edge, we have a little bit of daylight there. Um, so I would like to see a little bit more space there, either more or less. But in this case, I don't want to see less because then I would cut in into that cub that's in the foreground. But um, and the same thing at the bottom, you see how we're cutting off that, uh, that paw at the very bottom. 
Um, I would like to see a little bit of room there. So I'm not cutting that off. And, you know, by the way, guys, you know, wildlife is what I do. So oftentimes you're going to find that I'm going to be a little bit harder and a little bit more critical of wildlife because that's what I do. So I, I'm always looking for, you know, what can I do to make an image better uh, and more so with wildlife than with anything else. So, you know, hopefully you're taking that as constructive criticism. You know, it's oh, yeah. a great image. I'm just talking about how could we have made it, you know, just even better than what it is right now. But it's a great image nonetheless. Yeah, I think what you're talking about, I, I say about the like cutting off the foot there, uh, the tip is don't amputate subjects at the joints. So if it's a person, the ankles, right. the knees, right, or the wrists, uh, the, uh, the elbow or whatever, the shoulders. But I think this is just really a fun shot. And talking about criticizing, we could go through every one of Ansel Adams' pictures and criticize of it course. to death, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, by the way, I just want to go back to this. So we had 111 posts, and we just can't go through all of them. Uh, but we really want to thank everyone for doing them, for posting. Okay, Steve Sinek. Uh, now, I was up in... Uh, in Canada photographing the polar bears. And they're not easy to get. And I just love the, uh, the th this, this illustrates a lot of things. The rule of odds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is a good composition rule. I don't know if it it's looks, it looks like he darkened the edges, which is something I might have done. No, Ansel Adams said a picture's not done until you darken the edges. All the eyes are open. We have separation. Uh, I like it because it's uh, an environmental shot. A lot of people, when I was up there in Canada, people have like, I'm exaggerating a little as I always do, like 8,000 millimeter lenses and they just want a tight shot of the polar bear. So for me, this type of shot is really nice. I know I, I shoot it both ways, of course. I take the tight shot, but what a nicer environmental shot uh, this is. And it feels like a family portrait, right? Where you have <laughs> it, 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 I mean, yeah, it's a, a little family portrait. And that's, I think what I love about this the most is that you have this, you know, what feels like this little family unit that's nice and tight and connected with each other. We are connected with our subjects because we're looking into their eyes. They're kind of looking back at us. And, you know, the fact that the, every single one, if you pay attention, all three noses are kind of obscured a little bit. Well, that's okay, you know, because yeah. it's kind of telling a story. We still have a connection with those eyes and the light is coming straight at them. So you get to see a lot of beautiful detail in that fur and the light is beautiful. You know, it's, it, it, but it is strange, you know, and this is the world that we kind of live in now, right? In that we're seeing polar bears on grass, you know, we're oftentimes used to seeing polar bears on ice. So it's a little bit, little bit different to see the polar bears on, on the laying on the grass. Well, that's a whole nother story, because when I went up there, I think I was there, uh, I know I was there 15 years ago. It was all ice. I mean, yeah. it's all ice. It's all snow. And now people are going up there and seeing, you know, scenes like this. So the world is changing. I was talking to my friend, Jonathan Scott, who we're going to talk about a little, little later on in the show, how uh, uh, Africa is changing. Susan, uh, who knows? We scuba dived exclusively. All we did was underwater photography. Marty Snyderman knows this from 1980 to 1990. And the fact is, and uh, maybe uh, Marty will agree, that people today are not going to see what we saw, especially in places like uh, Key Largo. But that's another discussion. So anyway, Juan and I were only supposed to pick uh, three pictures. Uh, but then I said, okay, I got to pick one more. And, you know, one of my bird photography and Juan does the same thing too. One of his tips is, you know, if the eye's not in focus and well lit, you've missed a shot. Well, the thing is the exception is when you're going for a silhouette. And I, I just love the mood, you know, the most important thing in a picture is the mood is the feeling, uh, the emotion. Uh, and that this was taken on an overcast day. Another tip in bird photography is wings up or wings down. So here we have the wings down. Well, the, the feathers at the tip of the wings are separated, it's tack sharp, and that the foreground elements are included there. I think this is just a, a funny picture. I mean, it's a good picture, but here's a funny thing. Uh, you know, I know how to put a, a sunset into a picture. So I said, hey, Kevin, do you know mind? Like I do, as a lot of you know, I said, do you mind if I play around? So I made this like a sunset and he said he liked it better. And then in the end, I liked it better too. So uh, good job, uh, Kelvin. 
I said, and I agree. I, I love, I love the feeling uh, of the motion and how dynamic this image feels. Yeah. Um, certainly if we had had a little bit, you know, I, I, I didn't see your sunset version of this, but having that, you know, sky be kind of golden colored, I think mm -hmm. would have added to this, to this image. And, and, you know, and I would be perfectly okay with that because to me, you know, I, I know a lot of folks don't like to do that much editing, but to me, that is simply, you know, a factor of changing your white balance, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, if you change your white balance, you'd be able to get an image that feels like it was during the sunset. And to me, white balance is another creative tool, kind of in my quiver of tools to use when I'm, when I'm shooting, whether it's out in the field or in post-processing. Um, you know, I do like the fact that we have this sort of foliage in the, in, yeah. you know, together with it because it gives you a sense of place. It doesn't give you, you know, it's not just a bird against the sky. You do have yeah. a lot of this other interest in the foreground, which I think adds a lot to the image. And it's such nice movement and the blurred sky, I think is nice. And I don't know whether Kelvin, again, I have Kevin on the, on the bottom, uh, but uh, Kelvin did a nice job of, I don't know if there was noise in there, but most noise shows up in shadow areas and out of focus areas. So there's no noise in that. So I really like that. Okay, Juan's gonna, uh, so those are my picks from our members and Juan is gonna go through uh, his uh, picks now. And this is from uh, my longtime friend, Marty Snyderman. I love this image. This is just to me, you know, one of the best images I've seen in a long time. I love, love this image. I, I guess in the interest of full disclosure, I have a soft spot for turtles. <laughs> um, so first of all, so any turtle picture, you know, kind of immediately gets, you know, my attention. But the perspective here is just incredible. This newly hatched turtle kind of emerging from the beach. You get that feeling that this guy just came out of the beach, came out of its shell, dug through the snow and came out and is starting on its journey, you know, to the Sargasso Sea where it spends a lot of its life growing and getting strong. And, you know, by the way, I don't know if you knew this, but these guys have an incredibly small survival rate. This is why yeah. um, turtles lay so many eggs, especially sea turtles, because they, it's like, I, I can't remember the exact number, but I want to say it's one in like a thousand only make it to adulthood. Um, you know, some get picked off by seagulls or crabs just as they're emerging from the eggs and some get picked off later on when they're crossing the ocean. But this is absolutely you know, breathtaking, spectacular, so much detail here. Um, it tells a little story because we get to see that background, we get to see that beach. Um, the perspective, you know, again, you know, we talked about this many times, getting at eye level. And it's really hard to get at eye level with these guys, you know, but being in the water as these guys are going out, it's, it's, it makes for a remarkable image. Good job, Marty. I love no, it. I can't, I can't unmute Marty, can, and I can't because I'm uh, showing the pictures here. Can you do that? Because my guess is Marty used a, a dome port, uh, and he's uh, so half half of the uh, the scenes underwater, half is. So above. he has to unmute himself. You know, we asked him mute. Oh, he's he just unmuted himself. Go ahead, okay. Marty. So Marty, was this taken with a, a camera with a, a dome port? Yeah, wide lens dome port, close. Uh, so probably a uh, actually with a fisheye lens. Uh, although it's probably with a Canon eight to 15, mm -hmm. probably not shot at eight, probably shot on the 15 end. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes we, we can. can. Yeah. Okay. And so to, and, and to get the background, you've got to shoot at a relatively high aperture because you're right. so close to the, you need to be so close to the turtle in the foreground to help it fill a pleasing percentage of the frame. So it's, uh, you, you got to be able to cut to shoot at a, uh, a shutter speed that will accommodate being able to shoot at f16 or f22 in the back to get a background image so yeah, you're I mean, I, I, sorry, you're go ahead Rick. you're snorkeling no well actually uh yes if we used a snorkel at all we're really in in water that's about chest deep at the deepest so oh, this so is in micronesia mm -hmm. and there's a place where we just knew some turtles for hatching on a little project i was working on and was just able to uh, time it right. Usually, it, uh, quite often it happens at night. You can't get it, but 
right. occasionally they'll they'll hatch in the day and things worked out. Well, thank you yeah. so much. Thank um, you so much. Go ahead, Juan. I'm I'm just incredibly jealous of this image. I mean, not just the image of the experience of being there as these cats are hatching and coming in into the ocean. Again, like I said, I have a soft spot for turtles, all kinds of turtles. So, you know, to me, this is something to look forward to, something that inspires mm -hmm. me, something that I, I need to go out there and make an image like this. Well, a couple of things, actually just two things. One, this illustrates another point that the closer you are to the subject, the more intimate the picture becomes. So you're really up close and personal. And uh, the second thing is today we could do this in Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take an underwater picture, topside picture, use a smudge tool and do that. So good for you, Marty. And it's, I'm so glad awesome. that we reconnected here on the, uh, on the photo. As am I, Rick. Thank you. Oh, sure. It's great fun. Okay, Juan. Um, well, this is, uh, I love this image. I love the feeling. I love the layering that's going on here. Um, you know, this is a technique that a lot of people don't often use or not enough. This is an image from Doug Buckley or Buck Blues. Um, I'm, I'm totally butchering that name, I'm sure. I think it's Buckley. But I love this big horn sheep and maybe it's a Borrego uh, subspecies of the big horn sheep um, because it's a little skinnier than a typical big horn sheep. I don't know, maybe. Uh, but it's still kind of a... a, a pretty sizable adult because you can see how big those horns are. But I love the layering effect here between those um, yellow leaves in the foreground, you've got your, your, your sheep and then you've got your, uh, your, your background, it, absolutely beautiful. I love the angle where we can actually see, you know, I often say that for wildlife, my favorite angle is about a 45 degree angle, which is exactly what this image is because you get a little bit more or um, uh, uh, shape and dimension to the subject. So you can see more of its features, in my opinion, as opposed to like a straight on or a 90 degree angle. So um, the only feedback that I would have is, you know, I love to see a tiny bit more room on the right hand side. That edge is so close to that horn. But, you know, I'm nitpicking here. I think otherwise, this is an absolutely beautiful, outstanding image. I think it's framed for a cover, but I, I might take out those brown twigs in the back. But it illustrates, you know, a really important tip, not only the angle that you talked about, but the eyes not in focus and well lit. Uh, you've missed the shot. Also, the gesture of the mouth. I, yes. A little bit open, looks like it's saying like, hello. Okay, yeah, Doug made the Doug made the comment that it was raining. So that's why there are streaks in the fur. Oh, ah, cool. Thank you, Doug. Thank Very you, Doug. Nice. And thanks for being here. Yeah, and actually, I just want to get back to somebody. Uh, Jack Lawless said, uh, looked it up, and he said <laughs> that, uh, you know, one in 1,000 to one in 10,000 sea turtles make it to adulthood. So think about that. Yeah. Most of them never make it. So uh, thank you, Jack, for, for looking that up. I thought it was about one in 1,000, so I didn't realize that it could go as high as one in 10,000. Okay, let's go to the next one, Rick. Oh, yeah. So this was, you know, Roni is uh, really, you know, lighting it up in the on the wildlife <laughs> yeah. category with some of her wildlife shots, and this one is just insanely powerful. I love the light on on uh, on, on this one. The way that um, the light is falling on the face, and we kind of have some mysterious light or dapple light on the rest of the body and on the tail you know, absolutely mesmerizing. And, you know, you can see how we're making a connection with a subject and so much so that, you know, the hairs in the back of your neck kind of stand up a little bit, right? Because they do look like this guy's about to pounce on you at any second. Absolutely well done. I love the sort of dark mood of the image as well. The fact that everything else was so you know, kind of darkish, but the light that that sweet golden light falling on that uh, on our subject is really, really spectacular. Uh, I, I would agree with everything you said. I love it, especially the contact, you know, uh, I've been to Africa, I'm going to show some pictures and just to see the contact. It's amazing that these animals look right in the lens. Uh, I love it. And it's really about the connection. And that's what I think what a photograph is really all about. Uh, Alex says, as a, you've heard me say, uh, 
his camera is his microphone. So this animal is definitely speaking right to us. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, and this is my, um, actually, you can move on to the next one, uh, Rick. This is from Alex. Um, and, you know, it, and throughout this, you know, and this was not intentional, but throughout this whole session, we've seen, we've had the common theme is this connection, right? And, you know, for me, I'm a sucker for these images that have animals connecting, especially, you know, like I said before, a female or a parent with its with his offspring. And I absolutely love this image. You know, having shot many bears in my time, you know, you kind of see these, you, you know that these um, mothers absolutely love and protect with their lives, their, their cubs. But at the same time, when the cubs get a little rowdy and they get a little bit, you know, pains in the butt, she, they're not, they don't hesitate one bit to put them in their place. And to me, that's what's going on here in this image. I'm making up a little story in my head as I look at this image as to what was going on. And those are the types of images that I like the most and ones that make me come up with a little story in my head. And the story, Rick, that you may come up with may be different than the story that I come yeah. up with. It doesn't matter. The fact that it made me think and made me want to come up with a little story makes a big difference. You know, there's a lot of things I like about this picture. And I just share a story. Uh, you know, Alex is not a professional photographer. And there's a lot of people out of a group who are not professional photographers. And I think a lot of professional photographers would die to have a shot like this, right? Oh, yeah. No I mean, this is a this is a killer shot. Alec is actually right now shooting on the Oregon, <laughs> shooting on the Oregon uh, coast. So he's not uh, he's not uh, joining us. OK, so. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing uh, close ups. So uh, we have a category for flowers and we have a category for uh, close ups. So in other words, add that topic and then Juan and I are going to pick our favorites and go through uh, go through these. So we hope you uh, enjoyed that. And uh, again, thank you guys for posting. So I'm going to go through my pictures now and then Juan's going to go through his. So today is about wildlife and I'm going to actually I picked all big cat photographs uh, because I love big cats. But these tips can be used for all types of wildlife. Took this uh, in Kenya on the Maasai Mara. And just illustrate what I'm going to do is try to give you a tip for or two or three for every uh, for every picture I show. So we have separation here. All these big cats are separated. We could see their eyes. We could see their faces. And these two mommies were just coming out of the forest. Susan and I in the safari vehicle, and we're tracking these animals. In the background, we talked about the Lima picture. The background was very distracting. So I was showing Alec uh, how to do this, where I selectively. Uh, blurred the background so it wasn't as uh, distracting. Another tip is uh, getting down at a uh, eye level and I'll show you how I did that uh, in just a couple of minutes. Uh, so I think those are, those are about all the tips I could give for this picture. But again, separation is really important when you have more than one image. Well, so Rick, nice you know what I love about that previous image is that we can see every single one of these cat's eyes. Well, if you look closely, thank you. If you look at the uh, two, two mommies, you could see a lot of flies on their faces. Right. And my friend Jonathan Scott says, Rick, this is amazing that you got that picture with cats with all their eyes open because they blink a lot to get, yes. the flies, get the flies out of their eyes. So uh, that's amazing. A beautiful, beautiful image. I love oh, it. Thank you. It, it was a, well, you know, uh, John, well, I'll talk about that later, but Jonathan is going to do a big cat man a conversation with us, with Juan and myself uh, in three weeks. So we'll talk uh, about that I'm later. Looking for, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. So anyway, a nice enough shot. It's a portrait of lions, right? It's, it's okay. And if you go to on safari, if you go somewhere, you can take portraits, but it's a portrait. Action shots. This is this is what I try to go for. These lions were mating. You got the male on the right. Or you got the female underneath. And what I try to do is I try to anticipate the peak of action because that's when you get like you know the most action. Also blur the background. Now one, I and Alec, I don't know if you can see it, but right above the hairs on the male's face, there's a little dot. Can you see that little dot? I can. Yeah. That's a fly. 
This shows you how sharp the new Canon 100 to 400 millimeter. Well, it's not new anymore. <laughs> no, I could have cloned it out, but you could see the yeah. black body in the white. You can wings. see. Oh yeah, I can see a tiny little fly right there. Yeah. I mean, this is amazing. But that, that's another thing. But again, I blurred the background a little. We saw Ronnie's awesome picture. Uh, well, we were photographing <laughs> this big cat up on the left, and it was in a tree, and so we had a spotlight because it was backlit. So we're using the spotlight to illuminate it. So we're moving the spotlight back and forth and adjusting the power so we could see the animal and some of the uh, background. Uh, because it's happy hour, I darkened uh, what it was eating because <laughs> it's the ribs of a- Because <laughs> it's a family a, show, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, look at the right, <laughs> excuse me, the peak of action. So this is what I go for. So yes, you know, I have my one picture promises, the shot I want to get, but a lot of times I'm looking for the peak of action. And if you photograph big cats for some reason, you like cats with their with their tongues at tongues out. Okay, gesture. Uh, Juan talks about this, and you'll see this in his pictures pretty soon. Gesture is like the key. <clears throat> this is how I choose my wildlife pictures. We have the gesture of the mommy looking down. You have the movement of the mommy's right leg. You have the gesture of the little cubs, their legs are moving, and you have the, the guy in the left looking right at me. So out of all the pictures I took of these guys, <coughs> excuse me, it's the, it's the gesture. This is why I picked this. Also, another tip, when you're photographing a backlit subject, this is when it's really important to have your highlight alert on and your histogram activated, because you don't want to blow out those uh, those white, uh, those bright areas. And also, <laughs> if you want to win a photo contest, enter a backlit shot. Uh, gesture. I'm going through these quickly because we spent a lot of time on the others and I didn't want to get to one shots too. Uh, these two no, don't leopard worry. We have We have plenty of time. So go ahead. Uh, take your time. Uh, these, thank you. These two leopard cups. Look at this. This is, these are like two brothers, like brotherly law. Oh, and look at, look awesome. at the, Look, thank you. Look at the catch. Thank you very much. Coming from a wildlife expert. Look at the catch light in their eyes. Look at the way the guy on the left is looking at me. But here's my tip. And I know Juan shoots at auto ISO. Uh, and I know you can't set the ISO. Uh, but I always shoot at the lowest possible ISO to get the cleanest possible shot. Because here's the original. And this is nice and warm. And this is cool. It was taken on the shade on an overcast day. Uh, with the 100 to 400. I could have gotten closer, but as Juan knows, I think if you ask him, uh, what are your two top uh, wildlife photography tips? One would be uh, respect the subject. And the second yes. would be respect the subject. <laughs> <laughs> right now i like and, to say i like to say no shot is worth you know putting your subject in danger right so i took this shot and we were there were four vehicles and we we're all waiting our turn and i could have gotten closer but that would have scared these little guys on, on the safari and i wanted everyone to uh, to get the shot so because i shot at a low iso I was able to make a nice uh, enlargement. So by now you might be saying, hey, Rick is a pretty good, These look at these cute little cubs here, catch light in the eyes. I'm shooting at eye level, the background's blurred. By now you might be saying, hey, Rick's not a bad, a big cat photographer. Well, <clears throat> this is what I wanna talk about. I, want, I always give credit where credit is due. So basically for all the shots that I showed, that I'm gonna show, uh, I'm only taking 25% of the credit. Uh, my, this is my friend, Jonathan Scott, we're going to be doing in like two or three weeks, this big cat man uh, conversation. Uh, I think you're going to like it. He uh, lives in Nairobi. He has a cottage on the, uh, on the Maasai Mara. He arranged this, uh, this trip for us. So how did I get some of these shots? Well, <clears throat> here's a safari vehicle that he loaned Susan and myself for a week. I mean, this has a little balcony on it. It's a private vehicle. There I am hanging out. That that covering like flips up, uh, <laughs> uh, so you could get down at eye level. So Jonathan in the vehicle, honestly, uh, get twenty five percent of the credit for all my pictures. Simon, this guy, you know, like six hundred yards away. If you've been on safari, Ronnie's been on safari. She knows that they could they could see they couldn't see the fly on the on the line but it's amazing what they can see so jonathan in the vehicle get 25 percent of the credit for my shots simon gets 25 percent of the credit uh, susan salmon gets 25 percent of the credit because i'm usually sleeping in the safari vehicle like 
we get up early. I get I get tired. Is, so, is this your is this your nap time? Because I know I know like you guys you you've heard Rick tell tell at the very beginning. I've known Rick for a long time, and there's one thing that's sacred to Rick, and that is is nap time. Yeah. You know, that and cropping his pictures. You can't crop his pictures, but no. that and his uh, definitely nap time. No, that, that's it. Nap time's really important. Uh, actually, the picture on the right is staged, but it's it's really true. Susan gets a lot of credit because she helps with the lenses. She has a good eye uh, and she's very supportive. But actually, when I'm sleeping, she like wakes me up and, and I could get the shot. So all kidding aside, I'm not kidding. I really think I only deserve a 25 percent of the credit. Uh, for the shots, because I have so much help. And I think it's really important when you look at someone's pictures and say, oh, man, you know, you know, you just don't know what 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 went into making in these pictures, what, what went into making of the pictures. This picture was taken. Uh, uh, this is the first picture I act actually took on the safari. We landed, we had jet lag. Uh, Simon, our guide said to us, what do you want to photograph? Susan said cubs. We drove a half hour and we got the cubs. So I think it's really important to give credit where credit is due. So anyway, in about two weeks, Juan and I are going to host this show right here on June 24th, uh, 10 a.m. Big Cat Conversations with the Big Cat Man. You'll love this. Jonathan lives there. He lives for con con uh, uh, conservation. And it's really going to be a, an awesome show. Just another I'm, couple. I, I can't. I mean, I'm looking forward to that. I've, 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 I've seen so many things from Jonathan that I'm just dying to meet him. If at least you know over Skype, it'll be awesome. Well, I got emotional when I was telling you the story before because out of uh, before we went on, out of all the people I know in my life, I would like to be more like Jonathan Scott. He's a uh, he hosted the Big Cat Diaries. He has a show on Netflix. Just uh, look him up. I'm trying to go through these fast one because I want to get to your shots. Anyway, another tip, uh, name of the game, fill the frame, shooting eye to eye. You've heard of the elephant whisper. I whisper. I try to be the big cat whisperer. You saw this in Ronnie's shots. It's amazing. Uh, if you're patient, if you're patient, uh, and if you have a, maybe, I don't know, maybe Linda knows this, uh, you have a good vibe. The animals will look at you. Uh, just a couple of things on post-processing. I took this picture in uh, Botswana. Again, the mommy with the cubs. I'm big on post-processing when you need it, when you don't need it. Like on the left, I didn't need it. Uh, here's the original shot, backlit, flat because it's backlit, not a lot of contrast, a little bit of processing. You know, there's an expression that you can't spend too much time working on a picture because your soul is in the picture. Now, this is a dumb luck shot. I happened to be in the safari vehicle in the only seat where the vehicle stopped, where this little baby, like the bear picture, was communicating with the, uh, with the daddy. Maybe that was the mommy, I don't know. But anyway, I thought it was so cute. If that twig had been you know, over the lion's face, uh, it would have ruined the shot. But with a little bit of processing, blurring the background, warming it up and cloning and stuff like that, I was able to turn you know, a snapshot I didn't have time to, well, actually, it's, the animal's faces are properly exposed. I was able to do that. And also just one uh, thing, play with uh, plugins. Plugins are a lot of fun. You know, Ansel Adams said a picture's not done until you darken the edges. Well, you could also lighten the edges to get uh, a nice shot. I'll leave you with a, with a quick story. Uh, we were in Botswana, and the guide comes to the airplane when we land and said these lions are mating. Here's a male lion. Uh, he wanted to mate. They mate for three days. Here's a female lion. Uh, she didn't want to mate anymore. So they're growling like back and forth. Okay, this was quite a scene. All of a sudden, the male charges her and she jumps up like this and takes a bite out of his neck. And the guy told me, don't move. Whatever you do, don't move. So uh, the thing is, you see the twigs on the bottom. Well, there were some twigs in front of the vehicle. So I stood up. And I, I stood up and the guy looks at me like I'm crazy. So the animals, uh, the lions started coming toward me and I thought they were going to jump in the vehicle uh, to attack us. Uh, like you've seen, like, you know, a National Geographic where they come at you with the hunched backs and stuff like that. Anyway, they come into the vehicle closer, closer, closer and closer. And the reason they came because it was so hot, they lied down <laughs> in the shade of the uh, of the vehicle. They wanted to rest and maybe have a cigarette. Uh, yes. So I'm going to stop screen sharing. Now, Phyllis is laughing. So I hope you all enjoyed that. These are recorded. So um, 
you could watch. Hey, Andres from Canada just uh, joined us. Is growing a beard. So Juan, can we get to your shots? Yes. So let me actually share my screen here real quick. Steven is here doing great work. Are you doing that? I'm gonna now. I can look at the people. Okay. Awesome. So we have, uh, I guess we have about 15 minutes here. So I'm, I'll talk about a, a couple of different images here. This is one of, you know, I'm going to show a few images. I think the first couple of ones are from one of my favorite places in the world. And I have, there's a few folks here on the group that have been with me to Yellowstone in the winter, which is just an amazing, beautiful, incredible. Uh, I, I mean, I can't come up with, you know, too many superlatives or what Yellowstone in the winter is like. But one of the things that we are, if we're lucky, we're able to photograph are this ermine. This is, these are actually long-tail weasels. Um, and um, there are short-tail weasels. There are all sorts of weasels that actually turn white in the winter. And oftentimes they're hard to distinguish one from the other. So they're all called ermines when they turn white. And in the summer, they actually are you know, a beautiful brownish colors with some modeling sometimes or, uh, or, or different um, colors on them. But in the winter, they turn this in, you know, just pure white. They're sometimes incredibly difficult to find and photograph. And one of, this is absolutely my, my very favorite image of, uh, of ermine in the winter because it really goes to show you how well they blend in to their background. Even though, you know, we it's it's against all these little um, willow twigs, you know, it's still kind of blending into the background, and it's really curious. Looking at me, these guys are probably the hardest animals to photograph. They are spastic is the best word that I can come up to describe them. They move insanely fast. They stop for literally half a second, and then keep going and run again. And sometimes they'll just like dive into the snow and tunnel. So you are following it and all of a sudden they like perform magic act and they completely disappear. You have no idea what's happened. Um, the couple of things that tip them off is obviously that little tip on the tail, you can see that. But oftentimes these guys are ferocious, ferocious predators. And one of the things that they do is they actually go out and hunt for voles that are about you know, half the size of these guys. So oftentimes what happens, the way you, you find these guys is because you see this, you know, a black dot jumping up during the snow. And you're like, what is that? And it's an ermine with a bowl in its mouth as it's jumping across. You can't see the ermine because it's white on white, but you get to see the bowl that it has in its mouth. And what they do is they move the bowls from one cache to another. So other animals don't find them and can take their cash food. Um, anyways, you know, one of the things that we talk about and Rick has one of his salmonisms is, you know, dead center is deadly, but you know, for every rule, there's an exception. To me, there's an exception here because um, you have this, you know, incredibly beautiful, uh, amazing subject um, and putting him dead center to make him uh, uh, more prevalent and more obvious, you know, makes this image. Plus, we have the tail going off to the side, so we want to leave room for that tail to be in the scene as well. Well, it's not an easy exposure to get white on white, where you can see detail in right. the feathers. I mean, that's a good example of exposing for the highlights. Yeah, uh, absolutely. This is, you know, you one of the things you want to do in a situation like this, if you can, if you have the time to set the camera, is to you know set your camera manual and expose for the snow, so expose for the white, and let everything else that's in the scene fall where it may. Um, you know what's interesting is you know I've been I've been leading workshops in Yellowstone for 16 years. I've been going there for every winter for 16 years in a row, and I can tell you that out of the 16 years, there's probably been four times where I've been able to, or three or four times where I've been able to get good images of these guys. Most winters, I don't see them at all. Some winters I do see them. So whenever I get to see them and I get to, to photograph them, I consider that a successful trip. And one of the things I wanted to do here also is, you know, Rick was kind of showing these sort of big animals, um, the big cats. 
things that a lot of folks, a lot of us are very familiar with. I wanted to show, you know, some of those lesser known wildlife species, right? Some of the lesser known wildlife species that we don't see all that often. Let's look at another one here. That's beautiful. And this is an image that I worked at for a very long time. And I say work that is, you know, I hunted for this image for a very, very long time. Um, you know, I always, you know, we talk about, you know, visualizing and preparing and, you know, all the trips that I've made into Yellowstone for many, many years, I always wanted to get this exact image. You kind of go every year in your mind, coming up with a couple of different uh, scenarios, a couple of different images you want to make based on your previous experience and other images you may have seen. And I always wanted to get a red fox, which I absolutely love, curled up with snow on them, you know, and if I got lucky having it peering at me. One year I got lucky and I got, and I got the shot. And I think that um, uh, we have somebody here in this group, Mike Cullivan, that actually was there. Mike and Linda was there with, with me when I made this shot. Um, they actually should have a very, very similar image to, to this one. Absolutely one of my favorite shots, only because, I mean, I love the image, but because I've looked for this image for the longest time when I've been going to Yellowstone. But you can see that one of the things I try to do is not put the subject dead center because I wanted to set it in its environment, I wanted to be able to show the environment that it was in. Um, and I love that little um, line at the top of the snow that gives you a little bit of context to what you're looking at. It's not just a white background, but you can see a little bit of a ridge in the snow. Now, another one of my, you know, lesser known species, this is a pika. These guys are kind of a cross between a hamster and a rabbit. And they, they literally are kind of like a cross between those. Um, these are one of what we call keystone species, species that actually are indicative of climate change. And the reason for that is because they only live in a very high altitudes and in talus slopes. Talus slopes are areas of mountains that are covered in rocks, a lot of tumbled rock. Think of like riprap, if you will. Um, and the reason these are keystone species is because they prefer those cold, high altitude areas. And as climate change progresses, their habitat is diminishing. So we're seeing um, pikas retreating or disappearing, I should say, from historical uh, grounds that they used to be in. Um, so, you know, the, again, this is in Yellowstone as well. One of my, again, favorite places. This is in the fall as opposed to, to the winter. And there's a couple of places that I know where we can photograph these guys um, pretty regularly. They're, they're kind of small, they're size of a gerbil, but they're pretty feisty animals. One of the cool things that I love about them is that they actually are harvesters. They, during the fall, which is when they're most active, you get to see them most often, they go around collecting grasses. They collect grasses and then they lay them out to sun and dry them. And then they, once they're dry, they store them for the winter and they do not hibernate. They may have five, six feet of snow above their burrows for the winter, you know, they build all these tunnels underneath the snow and they live there, you know, subsisting on the reserves. They may go to sleep for a couple of days. They go into a state called torpor, but they kind of wake up and they don't really hibernate. They stay awake all year round. And this is why they actually do all the harvesting. And one of the things I wanted to do here was really highlight, you know, the pika. Um, by isolating it from the background completely and kind of showing a little bit of the environment that it was in. And one of, and also show, like Rick said before, you know, capture the peak of action. This is as close or not as close, but one of the aspects of peak of action with these guys, um, because one of the things that they do is that they're kind of territorial. So once they're going around, running around co collecting um, grasses, to put away for the winter, they'll, they'll go up on one of the high points of their little territory 
and they let out a really loud yelp. And that's what this guy's doing. And it's kind of a warning tone for all the other um, pika that may be in the area that this is its territory. Just absolutely beautiful. One of my you know, favorite, favorite mammals, even though they're really, really small. Very cute too. Oh, they're super cute. They're, they're just adorable. And sometimes the cool thing about them is that, you know, they're so focused on in the fall, especially they're so focused on collecting their grasses for the winter that I've had them run over my legs, you know, <laughs> as I'm sitting down on the, on the rocks you know, to kind of photograph them, they'll like ignore me and just literally run over my legs as they go from one from one place to another collecting collecting uh, um, uh, uh, grasses. And the coolest thing is I have some images of this is that they'll also collect flowers. So the best thing is when you get them in a place like this and I have a few images of that and in retro retrospect, I should have included those. You'll see them kind of in pose like this on the top of a rock with a bunch of grasses in its mouth and a flower coming out. It's just absolutely beautiful. And cute. These guys are probably my favorite mammals. These are muskox, which you find in the Northern latitudes. Um, I went to photograph these in um, uh, north of Nome in, uh, in Alaska. Um, I'm actually doing a workshop next year uh, to a very Northern Alaska to shoot polar bears. And in there is an addition or an extension to that trip, or it can be done on its own uh, on the Dalton Highway, where we hope to also photograph muskox. And why I love muskox is that they're like, you know, miniature bison, if you will. They look like mm -hmm. bison, but they're smaller and they have these incredibly beautiful flowing manes of hair. Um, and they're very, very protective of their young. One of the coolest things that I've ever seen them do is that they will, you know, when, when, they're, when they have young and they feel a perceived threat, they will actually form a circle with faces out, butts in, and all the young in the middle. And that's one of the ways that they protect their young from predators, um, which namely the biggest predator that they have are, are wolves. So it's just an incredible sight to see how the de dedicated they are to their families and to their babies. Here we have a uh, a mama with its with its its offspring running on the right hand side with its father right be right behind them. One of my favorite images, not necessarily because it's, you know these these two images, not necessarily because they're the best images that I've created, but you know I always talk about. Well, trips, it's not just about images, it's also about the experience. And for me, you know, here I was photographing by myself. I had a friend with me, but he was down in the car doing his own thing. I was on my own in this incredible expanse in, in Northern um, Alaska. And it was, you know, the closest that I get to kind of a religious experience, you know, being in, being in this incredibly beautiful stark landscape surrounded by these animals. Um, and when I look at these two images, they just evoke the feelings that I had when I was there. So that's why it's one of some of my absolute favorite images of all time, not necessarily because of the best images, but because they evoke a memory and a feeling. And I love, again, the connection that's in here between these, these animals. Between, well, that's the main thing, the connection. Yeah, yeah and that's been really the, the theme female, of this. The female, <laughs> the male, and the, and its cub. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, trying to, again, talk about peak of action, right, Right, Because trying mm -hmm. to get that action. All the feet there. off one the ground, th someone commented about right. that. Yeah, feet off the ground. And, you know, one of the things that I worked hard at looking through my images, and one of the reasons why with these guys, especially, you need to shoot a lot, is because, you know, you, you know those horns oftentimes obscure the eyes. And I want to have my viewer to have a connection with my subject. So I wanna be able to have that clear view into the eyes. So oftentimes I may have some incredible images that show incredible action, but that tip of that horn is right in the smack of the eye. For some reason with these guys that happens, excuse me, quite often. Yeah, Phyllis noticed that in terms of being able to see the eyes so well. And there's another comment uh, by from Bonnie over on Facebook about the highlights that the way that you've captured them in the fur. 
Right? Yeah, I mean, a lot like to I said, look just, at. it's just the, the flowing mains of these guys are just incredible. And actually, one of the cool things is that you can, in, in Alaska, there's some places where you can actually buy the fur or buy um, um, uh, yarn to knit with. And muskox fur is incredibly supple and soft. It's just insane. The problem is that each bolt or whatever it's called, or your bundle of yarn, is about seventy dollars. Because <laughs> these guys are ornery. They don't like to be. <laughs> they not don't like, like sheep. their. Yeah, it's not like <laughs> sheep. They, it's hard to collect the fur from these guys. There are few commercial farms where they keep these guys, and they have to like sedate them and. And keep them to be able to in the fall in the in the spring to get off all the all the fur because they do shed and that's actually one of the cool things when you're in this tundra on the low-lying bushes there's tons of fur everywhere that you know it's 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 been like rubbed off or collected from these animals as they shed so while okay, another so one, question one, i'm sorry before you move on were you in a continuous mode while you were shooting absolutely especially with these guys you gotta shoot like i said you have to shoot a lot with these guys especially when they're in motion you know whether it's an image like this or an image like this you have to do you know it's kind of a game of numbers is one of the things i like to say even though i hate that phrase it's really a game of numbers you gotta shoot a lot so that you get one or two good images because you can't control when that horn especially is going to be in front of that eye and in my opinion i mean i have thousands of images of of beautiful muskox with that horn just bisecting the eye. And um, and they're no good as far as I'm concerned because you want to have that connection with the eyes. Those are the images that are going to really grab people. So yeah, you want to do continuous shoot and then you're going to throw out, you know, 90% of your images. And the last image I want to share with you guys is these two cubs. This is a place in British Columbia that I've been to for a number of years. And um, I've seen these cubs grow from tiny little things to being on their own. Um, usually cubs kind of go out on their own about three or four years. And this is like a first of the year cubs. Um, and these two guys were so much fun because they kept interacting through the couple of years that I saw them. It was just so much fun seeing them play with each other and, and mock fight and you know, and chase after salmon on their, you know, together. Um, I have tons and tons of images of these guys. And these two, are, this one is probably the better, the first image that I got of this pair that I was able to shoot over a span of a couple of years. Um, but even these little guys, look at those claws. That's yeah. to me, the one thing that always grabs me is these grizzly bears, the claws, even the tiny little cubs, they still have claws that could gut you in a minute if they wanted to. Awesome. Okay, that's that's all I have for you guys today. And I think we're close to getting in here to, close to the end. Well, Jack Lawless said, uh, loves the emotion. Uh, talking about your pictures, he said, loves the emotion all your pictures want. Uh, uh, shooting on continuous, love the feet. Yeah, well, we definitely, you have a lot of great comments there. And we want to thank everybody. I see Steve, Jack is uh, relaxed. Drinking Texas bourbon? No, <laughs> no. Yeah, he is. He is. He treat, uh, He turned me on to Texas bourbon. So next week, once again, we have uh, close-ups. So uh, post your. Uh, oh, Anne, Amy is has wet red wine. I think it's a still picture. Anyway, next week is close-ups. So please post your pictures. Add that topic close-ups. We also have a topic flowers, which is different. So we uh, look forward to seeing you guys all next week. And we want to thank Alec, of course, for uh, kicking everyone out who shouldn't be here. Uh, is this our he, he's and a I admitted I admitted five new members. So it's not just about keeping people out. We had right. Right. Just five letting new members the good people in, keeping the bad people in the out in the last hour. Well, thank you so much. OK, everybody, uh, thank you so much. And we'll see you. Uh, thanks, Tommy. Just gave us away. Phyllis uh, is always here. Uh, Tina, Arlene, uh, 
Yeah, again, folks, make sure to tag your images in the in the group for the close-ups if you want to be included in uh, next week photo happy hour. That's the way we're going to do things from now on. We're going to dedicate half of the show to your images and half of the show to some of the images that we may have shot, and we want to tell you a little bit about them. Yeah, and uh, and post comments on what you're doing. I see Ronnie's here. Ronnie turned me on to this Wolf Center in Connecticut, which I think is still closed. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, can you un can I unmute Ronnie? Yeah, you can you can Go ask ahead. him to unmute, and he has to unmute himself. It's actually in South Salem, New York. Okay. And I just adopted Zephyr. Okay, they're, one of the wolves. They're hurting. Yeah, Zephyr was pitch black when I first photographed him. He was not even a year old. And now he's about nine and he's like silver gray. But awesome. they, they post live updates every day. With well, if you want to photograph wolves with uh, Ronnie, to say I want to photograph wolves with Ronnie over on our page. So uh, thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. Uh, be safe. Stay well. We know there's a lot going on in the country and the world, and we, um, we hope that this is a place to forget about that for about an hour. So thank you all so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, folks. Take care. Bye. See you Bye. next week.